I want to preach on the idea of the most pressing need of the church. We have a lot of needs in the church, and this came about as I, uh, a few years ago, when I was a pastor, and I preached something along this line. And uh, before I got even started, some of the people even started saying, this is what we need, this is what we need. One lady was one of my good friends, uh, waited after church and said, this is really what we need, Pastor. But uh, we can name a lot of things, but uh, as I was listening to some of the debates this week and last week and things, and I thought, you know, we need something in America that's going to change us. Not politicians, not uh, new life. We got what we really need, and that's Jesus in us. That's what we got to look at today. What is, what is the most pressing need of our church? And the thought came by this morning as I was getting ready to come to church, really, it might be the pressing need of our nation. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the 17th chapter of John. This is uh, known as the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. By the way, the kids are supposed to leave. I guess they left. I don't see them here. Uh, us preachers forget to do things. We're not up here all the time. But this is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. This is what we're going to look at today, John 17. But we want to look at uh, the 20th through the 26th verse. So let's stand as we read from God's Word. There we go. He says, My prayer is not for them of us or alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through uh, their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I, in me and, in, and I am you. May they also be in us so that the world may know, may believe that you have sent me. And may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Aren't those great words God's given to us? Jesus has prayed for you and I. Then he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory of you have uh, given me because you have loved me before the world or for the creation of the world. And then it uh, says, Fa Righteous, Father, through, though the world does not know me, I know you. And they, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to the world, to them. I will continue to make you known even under uh, what the, the love you have for me. Maybe in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus has prayed this prayer for us. And uh, I, forgive me for stuttering there. The light's kind of in my eyes a little bit. But God has given us something that we can hold on to. Father, as we come to you, we pray that you will give us strength today. Give us wisdom from your word. And Father, we pray that you'll bless each word of your of the Bible, Lord, to be talking to us today. And may we know, Jesus, beyond a shadow of a doubt as we leave today that you're in charge of our life. Thank you, Lord, now for these thy people and this thy message. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now the most, if, uh, I think I turned it off. Back on yet. The most uh, pressing need of the church uh, to you, if you could just think a minute, what is the most pressing need that you can think of in the church? Before we start this, I want you to kind of think along with me. What is it? In your present position in the church, what do you think it is? Well, I kind of went through the church. Now, I might have left some out. If I did, I'm sorry. There's some that I thought about later that I should have put on there, but I didn't. But I just kind of got went through the church to see what uh, uh, 
uh, maybe some people think it is, but uh, okay, let's look at this first. There's three things that Jesus gave us in this verse that we read, or in this chapter. First of all, he prayed for his will, God's will in his life. Do we ever pray that when we, we uh, sit and pray? Now, Lord, it's not my will, but your will. Here lately, I've gone and prayed and talked to the Lord. He says, Lord, I need this. I want this. And uh, made it kind of a, like a Christmas list. You know, Christmas, you write it out. says, boy, this is what I'd like to have. And I said, now, Lord, my pastor, whenever I was a teenager, told me this. He said, we pray for a lot. But he says, I throw it out before the Lord and says, no, you know what all it is, and you know what I need and what I don't need. And if you give me those things that I don't need, it's all right. But if you don't give them to me, Lord, I'm still going to love you. Just kind of go filter through them and all that. Have you ever just prayed, Lord, I want your will in my life? Starting off. Isn't this what Jesus told us to pray when we start praying, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. On earth, in, on earth as it is in heaven. He started off saying, let's pray for this. Jesus went to the garden to pray. He was fixing to be crucified. He was fixing to go to the cross for you and I. But he had to go pray. The human took over and said, okay, what's going to happen here? Boy, Jesus has the insight to know what's going to happen later, right? But he says, Lord, if it's possible father if it's possible let this cup pass from me don't let me do this send somebody else and i was thinking coming to church this morning it kind of if you're a committee person it'd be kind of like hey let's put it in a committee and see what really happens okay we're going to talk and okay i'm going to vote that that i go ahead and that jesus goes ahead and goes through uh the idea of the cross and all this stuff and the committee people says, okay, we'll do it. Then there's people like Mark would say, let's do it on an instant. Jesus, you got to do it. And maybe we're somewhere in between the board and those that want to do it real quick. But Jesus prayed as we might pray. Father, I don't want to go through this. And after we've gone through things, don't we just say, Lord, I wish I hadn't gone through that, but I'm glad I did because you showed me some things. Jesus prayed with agony and what am I going to do? But he said, okay, Lord, it's not my will, but it's your will that you want in me. I'm your son. I am in you, you and me, whatever you want, that's what I'm going to do. So first of all, he prayed for himself. Lord, what is your will for me today? Can we start that off and pray? Lord, what is your will for me today? You're in charge, not me. And then he prayed for the church. How many times have we just really sat down and prayed for the church? And since I made this, was working on this sermon this week, last week, and uh, God was leading me, I was praying, now, Lord, have I really prayed for my pastor this week? How about those people up here that stand behind the pastor and uh, play that music and sing those songs and get us all up? Do I pray that God would touch them? They might be sick. Maybe, God, you need to touch their voice. Or how about the kids? Help them to... When they take up the uh, building for an, for an offering, do we pray for them? And we pray for our ushers. We pray for those that are working in the church. How about those just every day that we know they come to your mind? I made it a habit. I can't mention everybody's name in a prayer, but when I think about them, God is saying, I want you to pray for them for some reason. Okay, I'll do that then. Who is the church? Is it this body right here? God said it wasn't. It's all of those that are believers. It doesn't matter if they're Catholic, Christian, Christian church, or Methodist, or whatever. If they are saved, have been forgiven, they are part of God's church, right? I had a little uh, lady, when my, one, of my, uh, one of my last pastors that I had in Texarkana, I had a man in my church. His mother was sick in the hospital. She was a Catholic lady. I have never, up until that time, ever gone to a, a hospital that I can remember and ministered to a Catholic person. 
It is different. They, they worship different than we do. I've gone to their uh, liturgical meetings and everything. How you talking about us? Stand, at least we get to stand all the time. They go up and down, just like this, all the time. Or at least they did in the one I was in. I said, oh, man, I'm tired. I'm sitting by one of the ladies. We went to a funeral, and she was in our church, and we were talking, and she said, I'm getting tired of this up and down. We followed whatever they did. We went up. They, they, they go up, we go up. They go down, we go down. But I met this lady. I'm going to minister to her. I'm a Protestant preacher. She's a Catholic lady. You can kind of get the picture. And I probably had some bias about Catholicism. I studied it in school and everything. And maybe I thought, well, maybe they're not just really on fire for Jesus too much because they do so much formal things. But you know, I went there to there because of the man that was in my church. His mother was sick in the hospital. So I went to her. Started talking to her. And the next thing you know, I wanted to go every day. Why? Why would a Protestant preacher want to go to a Catholic lady uh, other than the fact it first started out I was doing it because of my member of my church. I got where I had to go there every day. She was ministering to me. She was telling me about Jesus. Wow. I got to pray with her. The last day I was with her, I think 30 minutes to an hour after I left, she passed away and went to see Jesus. And I think about that all the time. Jesus, she ministered to me as much as I ministered to her. And every time I'd come in, she'd say, oh, here comes my preacher man. And we'd just sit there and talk, and her kids would be around, and her, her uh, husband's around. They just lit, looked. They was in awe that we were carrying on a conversation. I guess it was intelligent. I kept, she kept wanting me to come back. But do we pray for the church? This is what Jesus did. He says, I don't pray that you'll take them out of the world, but take the world out of them. Sanctify them. Give them something uh, a blessing and just keep them. Do we pray for the people in our church when we think about them? Sometimes we don't know the names of people. Sometimes their faces come to us. And, Lord, bless that person today. And then, if I can get this nut, he prayed for the future church. Isn't that wonderful what God has done? Jesus says, hey, there, in 2016, March the 13th, we're going to have people all over the world in church. Some of them are already out of church because they started way before we did, like yesterday. We would think in our time. But God said, let's pray for those. Let's give them something great. How about the service we already had with the singing? Do you like those? The singing, I love to hear. I don't sing good. That's why they put me, us preachers up here by ourselves so other people can't hear it and chase people off. But God said, I'm going to bless them today. Are you going to bless them? God's here. I, I got, uh, Terry says, God's been waiting here for us. And I thought, well, good, I brought him with me too. Isn't that God, great that God can be with everybody? The Holy Spirit's there guiding us and leading us. But still, as we look at this chapter, this is what God is doing. This is what Jesus has done for us. Now then, let's look at that question. To you, what is the most important or the most pressing uh, part of the church? What do you need more in the church than anything else? I've been in churches where there's a lot of need. How about comfortable pews? How about a clock so the preacher can tell when to get out? Or how about a choir up here and things like this? Uh, some of them would just say, boy, if we could just get a sign out there and let people see that we're the church of the Nazarene. And then I've been in some where I pray, Lord, take the sign down. That's the way they do. But what's the most pressing need in the church? Uh, why did Jesus pray like this in the garden? Why did he pray for himself, knowing that he could do anything? Or then he prayed for the disciples. He knew what the disciples were fixing to go through. He knew that they could not make it by themselves. And he also knew that we couldn't do it. So let's look. If we go to the treasure. Now, I just put some of these up, and I probably missed some of them, but the treasurer will say, 
okay, we need more money to uh, pay the budgets. Not too long ago, our treasurer came up and says, guys, we are in the hole. We need more money to pay our, get our budgets paid this year. That's a legitimate need, I think. It's just a matter of life. You have to have money to get things. Uh, my wife was telling me this morning the guy's got a, arrested because he decided he needed some things in the store he worked at, so he just took them home. He forgot that you have to go through the check out place you don't pay for them. So he just took them home. Wouldn't it be great if we could just do that? Okay, go in. Hey, I like this. I like this. Uh, I like that shirt. I like that gun. I like those uh, sports things and everything. We're going. I'll just take that home with me. Well, we have to stop and do it. Same way with the church. We have to pay our way, right? And uh, we have to have the treasurer say, we've got to have this money to keep us going. We've got to have money in everyday life to keep us to go buy food, to eat, right? So this is one thing we might say. How about Sunday school leaders? We used to call it Sunday school superintendent. Uh, more people to keep the average up. That way our church will look good, the district assembly. Instead of us having 65 this year, we had 165. And it looks good at district assembly. And people won't come up and say, what you doing? What you doing, Ryan? I remember a church that started over in Athens, Texas, when I was in Corsicana. They were doing great. I'd go to them and say, what are you doing to, to get so many people there? I said, well, we're just praying and trying to get people in. Never gave me any real concrete things that he did. But they were growing. Why? Okay, I went about us reaching more children and adults. We need more children to come in. We need more adults. That's what the Sunday school is for. And then we might look at uh, the world missions. We've got to hit the missionary person here. I believe in missions. And I, uh, missions are more than just going to Africa or South America. I've been to South America and enjoyed it. But uh, we've got to get more people interested in missions. We've got to get them going. We've got to get them... The other day, a few weeks ago, around just before Christmas or something, I lost time, we went down to a uh, church or a community and helped out, cleaned up a little bit. Why did we go? Because we wanted to. It's a mission in our church. Not everybody can go to missions, but we have mission presidents. We have mission people that come and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. We all can't go to Africa. We all can't be missionaries someplace, but we can be missionaries here. Also, uh, have a passion for missions. There has never been a missionary president that I've ever seen in a church, in the Church of the Nazarene, that didn't have a mission for, or a passion for missions. Oh, they wanted to do it. I'd even, there was one church I went to that uh, I'd go on vacation. I wouldn't come back on I think Sunday night when we had missionary service, I wanted to be there. And uh, I remember the lady called, or talked to Marie during church that day. She said, why'd y'all come back so early? I said, preacher, he, he just wanted to come back for missionary service. It's been so good. Have you ever been that way? i got to come back. i got to see it. And then, um, how about to uh, help give to the cause of missions in the church that others around the world, well, no, that's why we took alabaster offering oh it's going to build buildings we give a missionary budget a general budget that keeps our missionaries on the field we give we got to give we got to take up offerings for this but this is not the most pressing need of the church how about children's ministry boy this is something that they don't tell us we need more workers we need uh exciting programs for the children children with uh parents coming out and coming and helping and getting involved and, and knowing what's going on. But I think that's a good thing, that we need more workers in the church for the children's church. How about the teen? This is always an a area in the church that, what am I going to do with the teens? How am I going to excite them? I know when I was a teenager, we had things going all the time. Uh, we got to have more exciting programs. I can remember one as a teenager, we set up in the choir, was having uh, going to have uh, service that day, so uh, we sent up at the choir. Going to have a little program for the church, and I can remember one of the things that we had to do. Uh, we was going to get up and go out one at a time, you know, like people do. Get up, 
Uh, as we get older, we have to go out more. So they stumble over somebody, somebody having to feed up on the chair, of course, and couldn't get by, so they make a big ruckus and get now. We overstated it probably, but we, we uh, kind of set the stage. This is what happens sometimes. If you ever sit back in the back of the church, you see how many can go back. I sat in the back one day at uh, Texarkana First Church. I was tired. I came in a little bit late. I was going to sneak in so that I'd be all right. But wouldn't you know it, as I was sitting back at the back, the very far back, the preacher said, uh, have you seen Butch today? Somebody said, well, he's at the back. And he said, oh, there he is way back there. I could have died right then, you know. But I sat back there in that door right beside me, whoosh, 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 whoosh. One lady, one girl, young girl, teenage girl, got up, I know, at least ten times. She didn't even sit down once. I, I think she had ADHD or something like that. So we need more exciting programs. We need to entertain them. Teenagers need to be entertained. We're not here to entertain them, but we are here to entertain them. We want to make sure that they get excited. If it hadn't been for my youth directors in my churches, making things exciting and entertained us, I don't think I'd be here today. I don't know how many times I've went over to my preacher's house and she'd have, she, she could make these uh, donuts, and you probably know where Miss Womack. She could make some of the best food. We didn't dare not go to her house. She knew how to get to us teenage boys. And we went. We had a lot of programs going. And uh, get the adult, adults involvement. The teenagers said, we want you adults to help us. We want you to come in and help us. I went to a church one time, first church I ever took, and they wanted to know what we could do for kids. We had 35 kids on the road. We averaged 50. 55 sometimes, we had 35 kids on the road that were there every Sunday and Sunday night and Wednesday night. They were there. I guess it's because my wife and I were so young, they just stayed around us. We was always doing things with them. But one day we had a, had a meeting, and the board meeting, the, kids, the people said, we've got to do something about these kids. We're getting too many. I said, well, why don't you get in with them? So we decided that they would invite them to the house. Some of it was great. Some of it was a disaster. The first house they went to, the kids said, why? I said, they want you to come. But they don't like it. I said, why don't they? Said, because we're teenagers and we break things. I said, well, we'll just walk real carefully around that house and not do anything. As a matter of fact, they even told the lady in the board meeting, take your stuff off the wall. Put your knickknacks up so they won't break them if you're scared they're going to break them. They had a great time, a wonderful time. And the kids came back and said, man, that was great. They never were asked to go to come again, but they were asked to go to other people's house. But we need more involvement. Maybe uh, show us uh, we are needed and you care. How many times have you looked at a teenager and said, we really love you? I teach school, or I, I sub. I don't teach anymore. I just get to sub. I retired from the pastor. I retired from teaching school. Now I, get, I went back and subbed and and uh, it's fun subbing. It's a whole lot better than teaching, I think. You go in, you get to be friends with the kids. You get to hold them and, and listen to what they are, are doing. And you make a lot of friends this way. I try to make sure they know that I care for them and I want to see if I can help them um, with their grades. So far, they put me in classes except for chemistry. I've gone to that so many times. I'm like them, what are, we, what, what are we doing in here? But is this a need? How about our adults? Oh, we got to touch them, don't we? Uh, our senior adult leaders, we got to have more of them senior adults. The problem with that is most of us people, as we get older, we don't want people to know we're senior adults yet. Because even though I can remember going into a buffet over in Little Rock, my, my brother-in-law just turned 55, was able to get that ARP card, you know, so we go into Buffy's over there, all-you-can-eat place, and he loved them kind of places. And uh, they asked him, said, are you a senior citizen? He says, no, I'm not a senior citizen. I'm only 55. Well, unbeknown to him, my sister put in the op card in her purse. He got 10% off. He says, you mean since I'm a senior citizen, I get 10% off? Yeah, he started carrying that thing. <laughs> he gets 10% off now. Now he's in his 70s. 
Um, but the seniors say we want more involved in the program, more people to help with us, to in giving and working around the church and in teaching and in doing things that the church needs. It's always been said that 80%, 20% of the people in church do 80% of the work. It's been like that for years. Why, I don't know. But as I got older, I would understand a little bit. Maybe because we do get older. Okay, how about men's ministry? How about more involvement? Let's get them men involved. For so long, we let the ladies do everything. Now the men get involved. Let's get them to do something. More activities and have fellowship with. Let's go out and eat together. Men love to eat. I know there in uh, Texarkana, we, us guys got together and said, you know, why don't we have a men's morning prayer breakfast? And it used to be where they'd get me and a couple others in there, and we'd cook breakfast for them. We'd have biscuits and eggs and sausage and bacon, pancakes. Everything we could cook, we put in there. And didn't have no leftovers in either. But it got where, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. Grandy's is right next door to us. We'll go to Grandy's and eat breakfast. We had fun with our uh, praying, and then we had a little fellowship. And then if we need to do something around church, we'd do something around church. Or uh, more activities to have the fellowship, more men in the church. We need more men in the church. We need for them to come in. I like to see a lot of men in the church. Young men, old men, middle-aged men, teenage men, all of us. We need to be here, don't we? That's still not the most pressing thing. How about uh, women's ministry? More coming to the meetings. Better time uh, for the meetings. I did go back and correct that, but I see there's I missed that one. More times for the meetings. Sound like I come from uh, the hills of Arkansas. They talk like that sometimes. But uh, we need good times for so they can come. And I've been in churches that says, okay, we're going to have luncheons. We're going to have meetings at night. We're going to have something all the time for them. Not everybody can come. We understand that. But the women's ministries might say something like this. How about the worship leaders? Oh, now we're going to get a little ticky. We won't, uh, let's uh, get our hands together, like Terry said this morning. I'm not a clapper. Never have been. And I sure don't dance. <laughs> so I stand there. I enjoy the services. Uh, let's stand and praise God. Sometimes I don't, used to when I'd work all day, all week, and Ruth and everything, I just wanted to sit down. I didn't want to stand. Uh, let's sing. One more time. I was thinking of Jimmy Swagger. And I thought about this one more time. That's what he, he can play the piano great. But in his services, he'll always, let's sing that one more time. How many times you have a quartet up here? And they start singing again. You can just see the sweat coming off of them. And they're just, uh, uh, let's quit. But the leader said, let's sing it one more time. So we sing it one more time. Uh, the leader needs to uh, set the stage for the pastor. And that's true. Uh, I've been to services where you go, is that it? And they want me to preach after that? Why don't we just go home? Be better off. But then you get up, sometimes you say, wow, this is great. Man, ain't God here? Don't you feel God being here? These are all great, and we need this. How about the pastor? We can't leave him out. Okay, we've got to have more people at the altar. We've got to have more baptisms. We got to have more people joining the church by profession of faith so that we go to district assembly, they'll see what we're doing. And it also helps us when we move. They'll say, oh, you've got 26 people in this year. Great, wonderful. Um, we've got to keep everyone happy. Now, pre preachers just can't do that. So if you're expecting your pastor or any preacher to keep you happy, forget it. Because if I keep you happy, this person over here is going to be upset. You pray for your pastor. Pray for our pastor. Lord, give him the sermon that we'll need. I come here, I sit in the back. That's where my wife sits, so I sit with her. And uh, I'm listening to a sermon. Since Brother Brandon Powell, right? I want to say Patterson. That was my pastor a long time ago. But uh, every time he gets up to preach, I'm going, wow. Lord, what are you doing to me? That sermon last week was great. Then the sermon before that was great. And as I was preparing this, he talked about having a healthy life. I said, this is going to go along with it. He's talking about 
coming up to Easter. This is what Jesus did. The week before, went and prayed. He can't keep us all happy. But I just pray that my pastors would preach the word to me. I might not be happy. I might be uncomfortable. But I'm going to be happy when I go out because God's talked to me. That's what I want with my pastor. I want him not to look and say, well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't mention this. For a long time, pastors in church in the Nazarene said, we can't preach on tithing. People are going to get uh, upset. We don't give an evangelistic service on Sunday morning because people are getting ready to go to eat. It's another thing. Can't make them all happy. Um, how about the better sermon? Better apply. I've heard people say, I don't need to go to church. I've heard all the great sermons in the world. I heard people say that. I said, yeah, you're right. I've heard some of them good sermons too and read some of them. But it always, when Brother Lethenor was here, that is right, isn't it? Lethenor? In our some standing, he was, he was retirement age. He passed the retirement. Didn't he preach good? Then Brother Powell comes in and preaches good. Wow. I want him to preach something that's going to apply to me. But I'm not going to hold him to that. That's not the most. Sometimes I go come in and say, nah, it wasn't too good. But everybody else says, boy, I got blessed. That's what I want to see, though. Okay? Okay, these are all great objectives of the church. I don't think one of them we could take away. I think we need all of these. But these are not the most pressing need of the church. Or the world as we look at it. But let's just look at the church today. You and I. We can't do anything about the people over in Kenya or Russia or anything right now. But we can do something about us, right? I hope that's what we're doing. The most, uh, Jesus did not pray for these things to happen, that churches would be great. He said, boy, if we have a great missionary society, a great missionary president, we're going to have a great church. Or we're going to have, uh, if we have a great preacher, we're going to have a great church. Now, they do come to go together a lot. People come to hear the preachers and uh, everything. I had one lady say, I'm going to go out to the, all the, everybody around and tell them how great you are. She missed the next service. She must still be out, you know, tell them to come hear me preach. That's all right. But see, they give us all these things. When Peter came to Jesus said, what are we going to do about paying our taxes? He said, we're going to pay them. And he went and got a fish, got the money out of the fish's mouth and everything. Now, I don't say that you go down to the lake and do this. because You're not going to get there, okay? But Jesus said, we've got to do that. That's not the most pressing need of the church, though. What is the most pressing need of the church? Paul said, I want to show you a more excellent way, as he's writing to the Corinthians, and they were doing things that they were taught to do of the church. Let's have communion. Let's eat every day. We'll just make a feast of it every day. Every Sunday we come to church, we'll make a big feast. They weren't making communion, communion anymore. It was a feast. He wanted to show them a more excellent way. And he told them in uh, Philippians, he said, My God shall supply all of your needs. Paul had been there. Paul knew what he was talking about. God will supply. There's many, been many times I stand there, God, what did you do to me? Wow. You supplied that. Well, you closed that door, didn't you? But you opened another one. And then in 1 Thessalonians, Paul said, It's God's will that you should be holy. And God has called us to live a holy life. Now we have to define what holy life is. Given completely over to God. However you define it. You're going to worship Him in your way. Okay? Uh, Jesus in the garden said, Sanctify them by thy truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For then I sanctify myself that they too might be sanctified. The greatest need of the church, I think, today is sanctification. This is not what God does for us. This is what we do for us, and God works through us. Let me clarify that. Sanctification is a complete devotion to God. It's our part to come and say, Lord, I want to be sanctified. And to do that, Lord, 
I want to have complete devotion to you. I want to study to show myself approved of you. I want to grow daily in your love. And I want to be set aside for the glory of God. That is what sanctification is all about. That's what we need more than anything in this world. If we give ourselves completely to God, guess what's going to happen? All that other stuff's going to come into being. All that other stuff's going to be all right. We're going to make it. The treasurer say, hey, I don't know what's going on. I know uh, up in the wheat part land of the United States at one time, there's this guy who's going to be, they wanted him to be a treasurer because he owned the uh, granary and they knew how to keep books and everything. He says, I will on one condition. I'm a busy man. Don't ever ask me about the books or anything to the end of the year. The end of the year, they got to paint the, the little picket fence around the church, got to put a new roof on the church. They even painted the church and got pews and nice cushion pews in the church and everything. And then he gave his report at the end of the year. And they had, they were in the red for the first time in years. They said, what happened? He said, well, when you gave, you brought your wheat and everything in, I took 10% of it, put it in the church, put the tithe in the church for you. He said, I believe we can do this. It's wonderful when, a God, when somebody is so committed to God that they're willing to step out a little bit and say, I can do this. And then at the end we look and say, how did you do this? He says, I was following God. Isn't that what Jesus did? Yeah, Lord, okay. I don't want to do this, but it's your will. I'll do it. And then he hung on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. Can we do that? Isn't Jesus wonderful? And then uh, sanctification is a complete reliance on God that he will uh, take care of us, devoted to his calling. What do you want me to do, Lord? You may do what? You drive the church van. Lord, you know how them people are on that church van. Man, they're terrible. I've driven on, a, on one of them church buses one time. Oh, Lord, would you just get me off of this, all these kids on this bus? I'm about to die. You know what the Lord did? Put me on another bus. <laughs> he said we're devoted to his calling, not necessarily being a preacher, but to his will. When we accept Christ, we're saying, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I've met lay people going to the mission field. We have a thing in our church where lay people go on their own to become missionaries as lay people on the mission field, pay their own way. I met some in, in uh, Peru. We went down there for a mission trip. He is from Oregon. He was there when we were there. He was there before we came. And he, when he came down to this, he was going to stay. He called his mother. He called his dad that he was working with. He said, I'm staying on the field. And the last I heard, he's still down there. And that was 20 years ago. He become a lay missionary. That's where God wanted him. He didn't wasn't a preacher. He didn't preach any, but he sure worked a lot. We have to do what God can. We can't receive like others have re, have received, but we can have that experience of heartfelt holiness. Some call it perfect love. That we look at a person and say, "I love you in spite of what you do." I don't have to like what you do, but I sure love you. And I think as if the church. You and I, as a church, can believe this. We can change the world, don't you think? Um, there's four topics that we want to get and get into sanctification. How do I receive this? Um, the Bible says, Seek and you shall find. Ask and it will be given to you. Knock and it shall be opened. It's very simple, isn't it? Well, but I'm supposed to feel different. I'm supposed to feel a lot different. Joan and Bona Fleming, some of the great uh, evangelists in our church, early church, um, were holiness preachers. They weren't holiness preachers all the time. One day they had a revival. John Fleming received what we call the Holy Spirit was upon him, and he was just, man, he was just going out bubbling over, and everybody said, we want that. So his brother went up to the room and prayed, God, I want to be sanctified. He comes down and just tip just kind of trying to be bubbly like his brother, and he told his mother, he said, 
I got the blessing like John did. And she said, go see, your, go see your brother. You don't have a church. But I prayed for her. You don't have a church. We can't have it like somebody else. We don't get it like somebody else. You ever watch people eat? Aren't you glad you don't eat like them? Or aren't you glad you don't eat like me? You know, I've seen some. There's a guy, a friend of mine, the only man I've ever seen in my life that could take longer to eat than my wife does. <laughs> We'd sit down and he'd eat. 30 minutes later, we're all sitting in there watching the Cowboys play at our group meeting. You know, we're in there waiting for him to get through eating. Finally, he'll bring his plate in there and it'll still be half full. We've already gone back for three or four, you know. We don't eat like that. We don't dress the same way people do. I wear, I like to wear polo shirts because they're comfortable. One guy said, you're just wearing that for a show. I said, no, I'm wearing it because all I can afford. What do you mean? I got them on sale. I didn't pay the full price. I got them on sale. And so I told him where to get them on sale. He, he went and he got him one. We have a, in Texas County, we had a polo club. Those teenagers find out when they was on sale, they'd come back and say, hey, we got a polo on. I was right, but I didn't pay $100 for them. I went to Little Rock and got them for 13 Well, not why are the best that you can buy them for that, right? We can't get the Holy the experience at the same time, uh, but we know how to do it, maybe. We just seek and ask and knock. It's going to be given to us. Where do we receive it? Some people receive it at the altar. Some at their seat. I know a man that was in our church in college. His wife and family had gone out of town to be to see the parents or something. He had to stay and work. He came to church. He wasn't a Christian. He came to church anyway because he liked the church. He liked the people. He was our friend. We watched the first Super Bowl with him, with the uh, Packers and the Chiefs, very first Super Bowl. We sat there. And the next week he was at the altar finding Jesus getting forgiven of his sins. But you know what happened there after church? He was going home. There wasn't nobody at home. His wife hadn't got home yet. And the preacher kind of preached a little bit on sanctification that morning, that you need to go all out. He sat there in his car, bowed his head, and he says, Lord, why can't I just receive this now? Why do I have to wait till the service tonight? It's not an ideal where well, you get saved this morning, you get sanctified tonight. You do have to get saved first. You have to let God forgive everything. Why not just put it all on the altar right then? You can do it that way. Some people sit. Some people run and shout. Some people just sit there and cry and wave a handkerchief. But you can tell that something different happened to them. Uh, some people in bed. I talked to you, told you about that lady, Tesla lady. I had no doubt she knew Jesus. And I had no doubt that she could have made a good, holiness, Nazarene person, member of the church. When you walked in that room, you knew Jesus was there. Wow. She's a Catholic. We're not supposed to believe this way. They're Catholic. That's what I was taught all these years. I remember many times we'd have communion on Easter or something, and we'd have a community thing, and I'm sitting over here, one hand on the Lutheran pastor, one hand on the uh, Catholic pastor, holding them, setting them in the pew, so they wouldn't fall over. They'd been given communion all week. They give communion with wine, not the, not the grape juice. I had to hold him. We was in the Catholic church, I think, and he had to give the welcome. I'm holding him on there. I was going to give the uh, message, but I had to hold them, make sure they didn't fall hurt themselves. But still, they were a man of God, and I knew this. We can do, we can get salvation. We can get sanctified, sanctified anywhere we're at. We don't have to come to church. It's good to come to church. When you get sanctified, you can come to church more. Uh, at the store, walking there or jogging, you can just talk to the Lord. I like when I'm driving down the highway. You've got to pray when you're driving down these highways, as bad as this one is out here on 75 here, all these wrecks going on. Lord, just be with me. I get to talk with him. And I did that one day, and Miss my exit. I had to go four miles down before I seen the next exit. Turn around and come back. 
believe God for God every day. We can receive it anywhere. Why do we need this? Let's look at the spiritual side first. It fights Satan and his crowd. And boy, the dart's been thrown at us today. Christianity is under attack. They're trying to tell us we can't have this anymore. We have to go along with the other, other religions. I knew a man in my first pastor. It says, I'm a member of the Methodist Church. I'm a member of the Baptist Church. He was a member of every church in town but mine. He says, why can't I join yours? I said, to do that, you've got to come to us completely. No other time. That's what our manual says. He never came and became a member of our church. He never came a member of church, period. He's just a member of names and everything. But we need it to fight the crowd, the devil's crowd. We need Satan. Uh, we fight Satan and his crowd. We're able to stand against the fiery dart that Satan throws at us. I don't know how many times in school teenagers can be rough sometimes, you know. But they're awful good. They're just good people. And sometimes I just have to tell them now, I says, look, I can't do that. I can't accept that. God's too good to me. I get to talk to them a little bit about it. The fiery darts come in. God puts a shield up there in front of the Christians and says, I'm going to protect you. Lo, I will be with you, he says. The devil's going to throw the darts, but we're going to make it, I hope. The world is looking for something exciting. You ever think about that? Why do they go after all these politicians and, and why do they go after Obama whenever he first ran? Why are they going after Trump now? Why do they go after these other? They're finding something new, exciting. We want this. Why can't you and I be exciting? Hey, let me tell you what Jesus has done. I had a man, a friend of mine, that when he got saved, he got saved. When he got sanctified, you could tell it. He was telling me one day, and he says, I'm going to tell you something before I tell you what I'm going to tell you. Usually when I talk about Jesus, I have a tingling going down my spine. He's the only guy I've ever seen this. And we were standing there at the General Assembly in 1976, and he was telling me. And all of a sudden, he was just about to tell me what Jesus was doing. He said, there it is. And well, he was just kind of shaking. God was just going right up and down his spine. Now, I can't say that everybody's going to do this. But you know, I know that he knew who God was, and he knew where he stood, and uh, it enables you to uh, come boldly to the throne of grace. That's what the Bible says, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace. And then it says, uh, we'll be sitting at the foot of God in his glory. Only as you give your life to God will you be sitting at his feet in heaven. That's the spiritual part. That's why we should. God told us we have to be holy. Be holy for I am holy, he said. But then look at the personal. Your heart is in line with God's will. Just like Jesus said, not my will, Lord, but your will. Can you pray that wholeheartedly and says, Lord, I want your will? And God's going to say, well, you know, you got some things you got to give up or you got some things you got to do. Well, Lord, I'm willing to do it. You're in tune. Great awakening of your soul. Wow. There was one lady in a church one time, my brother-in-law was telling me, she would just sit there, three or four pews back, and he'd be preaching, and all of a sudden the glory would come on her. She didn't get up and run or shout or cry. She'd just go, whoo, and that was it. God had touched her. We do it different. But we're, it's awakening, more fresh, uh, pressing need of heaven. Do you have a real vision of heaven, of a pressing need? I want to be there. Well, you know, it's just, just a place we talked about. It's a real place. Do you have that pressing need to want to be there? How about, oh, this is a good one. God can use you. I went to, um, over here when I first moved here, sitting around the house. Man, I was bored. I couldn't get out of here. I'm a doer, not just sitting around sometimes. Sometimes I like to sit around. But, I went out, I said, okay, I'm going to see if I can sub. Uh, subbing uh, to where I came from took anywhere from three weeks to six weeks to get in there. I went to dinner, uh, Sherman, nothing wrong with Sherman, but I went to Sherman. The only address I could find was their old building down there. I didn't know it was the old one. But I got there and said, this must be a holiday. Nobody's here. There's not a car around. Found out later it's over here on 
Floyd Lake Road. I've gone to Sherman a lot of times before I moved there to try to get in there. They would never talk to me. Wouldn't let me hear. I couldn't understand why. I got credentials. I got good work ethics and everything. I want to teach here because my boy was here. They wouldn't even do it. Wasn't time. I tried to sub. They wouldn't let me sub. They wouldn't even, the secretaries wouldn't even put my, my um, resume through. I would go to Denison. I have a list of who I'm going to. Denison, Bells, all these around here. Went to Denison. I'm sitting over there filling out this form. She's on the computer. I don't know what she's doing. And I turned it in and said, you're hired. I said, but you haven't even read this. She said, oh, we've already done a background check of you. You got your fingerprints in. The state makes all the teachers have to put the fingerprints in and everything. And he says, we got all this. He says, here's a number I'm going to give you. Put it in your phone. Call it. And you can start, if they have something, you can start working. Okay. So I walked out. I says, right, sure. It's going to take three to six weeks, you know, to get into the system and everything. I called them that day. Put it in. Got everything I was supposed to do. Hung up. Hadn't even started the truck. I got a call to work the next day. God works in mysterious ways. I've been busy ever since. Sometimes it's I'm off when I take off. Man, I don't I don't need this six days a week. Then last year they put me in charge of all things Saturday school. This is where you send the guys that skip school, miss school, discipline problems, lazy, sleep in class. Miss, miss school, miss things, you know, they have to make up hours and stuff like this. I didn't know this until the first day I walked in. Oh, Lord, what if I walked in two minutes? It's all right. We're going to take care of it. You know, it's getting better and better. Look here. God's going to use us. Where are we going to be used at? I don't know. But are you open to let God use you? How about become more humble before others? Humble yourself before God. Okay, God. You said I could do it. Let's do it. Sometimes I do it and I think, God, where are you? I've fallen on my face. He said, I'm right here beside you. I did too. We shouldn't have done this. And God backs up and says, but I'm still with you. Let's see, what else do we have up here? Makes you uh, humble before others. Makes you realize that God is in, the, in charge of your life. You become a much happier person. As you bow to God, you can stand up against anyone. And as Paul has said, I know whom I have believed. Now the real question is, this is the most pressing need of the church, I think, in some places. When is the proper time to be sanctified? Oh, let's say today's Sunday. I've got to go to work tomorrow. How about Saturday, Lord? I'll be off Saturday and I sleep late. Let's talk to me then. How about now? Lord, now. And the Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now is the accepted time. We don't wait. It can change your life. It changed mine. And here lately, God has been searching. And as I read and study, I said, Lord, I just want more. And the beautiful thing about this, once we have received sanctification, we don't stop. Okay, I get off. I've been to people who says, we've heard all the great preaching, all the great singing, and their lives showed it. They had nothing. They'd get up, we'd go to the old folks' home, as they called it. We're going to sing. I went with them. They wanted me to go with them one time. Okay, I'll go with you. Now, you got to get a song because everybody leads a song. I said, I'm not. Maria did. She sings by that. But I, it got to be a circuit. They couldn't wait till that person got through so they could get up. Hurry up. My, I'm five away. Hurry up. I got my song. But then I've been to other places, places and they started praising God then. Something happened in their life. Hope you don't do it now. Work it out now. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. Um, I sing these songs. I love these songs. Amazing Grace. Slave Trader uh, said this, Lord, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was in the tr slave trade business. And you touched me one day. You know, John Wesley, 
didn't receive holiness until he preached it and believed in it. But he stood at the uh, door of the Aldersgate Church and heard the Moravians uh, explain, ex, ex, you know, praising God. He says, oh, I want that. And he started listening to it. And he said, my heart was strangely warmed. We sing these songs here, Amazing Grace, uh, draw near to me, near to God. I surrender all just as I am. It's all God wants. You to come just as you are. You don't have to put on airs. Well, Lord, I got to make this right. Nope. Just come to Him any time. I want to leave you with a, a man that uh, I think is one of the great holiness guys in the Bible. He didn't know what it was at times, but in Genesis, and I'm just going to read part of this that uh, Abram was going to take his son Isaac to be sacrificed in a burnt offering. Now in those days, they got the best they could, put it up on the altar, and had a burnt offering to God, and God blessed them. Well, um, Abraham, being as old as he was, couldn't carry the wood and everything, so he strapped it on his boy's back. Uh, my dad used to do that to me and my brother-in-law. Uh, oh, man, he would put... Heavy loads on us sometimes that we'd have to carry. I wonder why he didn't carry them. And now that I'm his age, I don't understand why. But uh, as they went, uh, God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the uh, region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering uh, on one of the fountains that I will tell you. I wonder how many of us could do that. Gee, I don't know. What about the grandkids? I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't be betrayed them for anything. What would he do is say, what, what would he say if he says, okay, take the worship leader or take the missionary president or even take the pastor? Mm, we might do that. We love them. Well, you know, we can do that. He said, take your only son, the one you love. Isaac was his only son. Abraham, to make uh, to go a little bit further, uh, well, Isaac spoke up to his father Abraham. Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, "Loving father, won't know what his son wanted. Uh, the fire and the wood is here, but where's the uh, supposed to be? Where's the ram for the burnt offering? Where's it going to be? We don't have it. Now, what would you tell your son?" What would you tell anybody that came up to that? He said, well, well, you know, how he is. Uh, we'll make it some way. No. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering of my son. And the two went on together. Why would Isaac go on together? He believed in his father. He believed that his father When he said God would provide, he believed that. Do you believe God will provide? And then we got up there, Abraham looked up. Uh, to make this, short, this story shorter, a little bit longer maybe. He got there and Isaac knew, Abraham said he's going to, God's going to provide. He said, okay, son, lay, on, lay, lay right here on this altar, on this mountain. Put him down there, strap him on, put the wood on him. He's fixing to light the fire. God wanted to see if he'd go all the way. And just as just before he lit the fire, Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and turned the ram, uh, went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. God provides. We just got to watch him. Okay? Um, there's... Three things here you need to know about sanctification. The world is watching our church. The world watches the Christian religion. Mohandas Gandhi, Gandhi, the great leader of India, he was a Muslim, he was a Hindu. That's all they had in India. And he made the statement one time about being a Christian. He said, if I saw one, I would be a Christian. A 
I thought, we have beach parties in India, maybe not at that time. But I thought, what about us? If people saw a Christian, would they become one? And then uh, the church is watching. People in this church watch what we do, how we react. And also, the world watches, family watches, and they want him something that they can count on. There was a man, 1800s, I think, early part of 1900s, called Dwight L. Moody, sitting just like you in a church. He heard the pe- preacher say, "God, the world has not yet seen cr- what God can do through one person. He said, I'll be that person. He started a church in Chicago, Moody's Church. People will walk across the whole city to come to his church. Why? Because he loved God so much, people said, that's a man that loved God. That brings the faith in God. God's good to us, folks. He has something in store for us. And my challenge today is let's don't just stop and say, okay, I've got it all and ever. Continue to grow. Pray for our church. Pray for our pastor. Pray for yourself. And really, you can't pray for the pastor in the church unless you start praying, Lord, am I okay with you? I go to work every day, and I know it's going to be a trial because I'm, I'm an old man. I've got to fool with these teenagers. You know, there's a generation gap there. We have a lot of fun. Let me give you this, and I'll, I'll close with Dr. Strickland's thing that he did a long time ago. Former uh, general secretary in the Church of Nazarene when he was the president of Nazarene Bible College in Colorado Springs. He went out to Denver, Colorado. Well, Colorado Springs, actually. He was going across the street. Now, this is back in the time of hippies, long hair and everything. Worse than it is now. And uh, he saw a guy standing there, a young guy. Now, Dr. Strickland was in his 60s. But he saw this young guy sitting, standing on the corner just crying, boo-hooing. Strickland said, I was kind of moved by something's wrong with that boy. He went up to him and said, son, what's the matter? He said, I just came from church. Some of the service this week. And God was there in such a way, I got saved. I don't know what else to do. And tears were coming down his eyes. I got saved. Dr. Strickland said, I got to talking to him. He says, here was a young guy and an old man standing on the corner crying. He says, generation gap was closed at that time. Isn't it amazing what God can do for us, folks? Remember this. God said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. And he will be. Let's stand. I challenge you that this week you will make it a better week for you. If you don't know God, ask him to forgive you. If you want more of God, Seek, knock, and it shall be opened. Ask, and it will be given to you. Draw near to God this week. And see if he won't bless you more. And you'll be a blessing to others. Father, as we come, we thank you, Lord.